only mode. Hello and welcome to our HIPAA risk assessment webinar. I am waiting for the screen to change here, so hopefully it will change. There we go. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide, and I am also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Uh, today we have some new subscribers from CMIT, I think, and I want to give them a shout out. I think this may be their first time on board. Feel free to ask um, as many questions as you can get in. We're going to take questions um, during the webinar uh, just because we like to keep it more interactive. Martin will take them over the chat um, and we'll do as many as we can and then we'll have more Q&A at the end. So. Our agenda today is we're going to review some learning objectives, a little bit of background, um, spend a lot of time on risk assessments, the vocabulary, the methodology, the timing, the responsible parties, and then do some Q&A at the end. So what we wanted to accomplish today is provide a foundational understanding of risk assessments, plural, because you're going to be doing more than one. And that's a key takeaway. We don't take away anything else, is that this is not a one-time thing. Um, TRICARE, part of their fine was because they didn't do a risk assessment prior to moving their operations when their tapes got stolen and I don't know how many millions of records were uh, compromised. So, um, but first of all, you got to know the vocabulary and, and the vocabulary is borrowed from uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, various resources. The NIST documents tend to be really um, uh, academic and, and, and um, descriptive. Um, they describe the problem. They ask you a bunch of questions that you should ask per step, but they actually don't prescribe what you should do. But we have borrowed the terminology and we're using the NIST uh, terminology in case uh, anyone's wondering. The same thing with the methodology. Now, the methodology. Um, we're going to talk about is agile, repeatable, and verifiable. And again, why do you need a methodology? Because you're going to be doing these more than once for sure. And if you haven't done a baseline risk assessment, you absolutely have to or you're going to be found to be in willful neglect. You're not going to be able to attest to your meaningful use uh, if you've adopted EHRs, etc. So that really has to do with timing, right? Number three, significant changes to your operational environment or material changes to applicable law. We've obviously had material changes to applicable law with the omnibus rule. So again, if you haven't done a, a baseline risk assessment, and th th we'll get to this, but this that's one of the implementation specifications. Um, in the security rule, one of the two that are that are foundational must do, or you, you are almost certainly going to be found to be in willful neglect if you have a breach, if, if you have a patient that complains, or if you have a, an audit. And four, we'll talk a little bit about who, who's on the hook here. Who are the responsible parties um, in addition to the compliance officer and, and the executive team? So bottom line is we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your HIPAA risk assessment should be conducted now that HIPAA is no longer a paper tiger. So really before the high tech got Act got implemented, and even further, really, before the omnibus rule, there was really not that much serious enforcement. There was enforcement, but that enforcement usually came as a result of a breach that HHS got wind of an, of an incident followed up, and um, or you know you had a, a great number in the case of Signet of patients complaining that they couldn't get their medical records. Um, you know, so and so forth, right? Those are the most common ways right now that um, that HHS that HHS is going to audit. And obviously, I think we all we all we all know that HHS has uh, has been mandated to come up with a methodology for um, audits, and there are probably going to be audits that occur like random uh, business associates covered entities of all sizes, sort of like the IRS. HHS has not come up with that. Um, methodology by which uh, audits are going to occur, but they are uh, required, mandated under the High Tech Act. So a little bit of background. So we're really going to be focused on one implementation specification of the first standard 
of the administrative safeguards in the security rule. It obviously has implications to breach notification. It has implications uh, to, provi to privacy, but we're really narrowly focused on one implementation specification, and it has to be um, where you should know that it's really fundamentally the most critical one because the next important one is um, the risk mitigation or risk management and actually implementation specification and the first thing you got to do in a risk management is to assess so the assessment step is really in two places we'll talk about that later but that's where we're, we're focused uh, no story good story fully compliant what do we mean here well if you if you get better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence that you're in compliance, you're going to be building a good compliance story. In this particular case, if you've never done a risk assessment, then you probably have no story and you're going to be found to be in willful neglect. And full compliance is an aspirational goal that you get to over time. You, the, most of your time over the next one to five years is going to be getting better and better at producing visible demonstrable evidence. You got to eat this element one bite at a time. I think HHS understands and has always understood that nobody uh, probably ever is going to be 100 percent totally completely in compliance. So uh, how do you build a good story? Well at the beginning you got to be able to make a good faith argument that you haven't thumbed your nose at the law, you haven't ignored the law. With respect to the security rule, this risk assessment is absolutely the thing that an auditor is going to ask you about. Show me what you've done uh, and when you've done your latest risk assessment. So we're going to go through some vocabulary. Uh, Martin, I'm assuming we don't have questions right now, but maybe we do. No, we don't at this point. Okay, so I'm not going to cover all the vocabulary. We've sent out the slides. Uh, so everybody should have the slides. If you don't have the slides, then look in your uh, spam folder, your junk folder. Uh, it, it, it's uh, an announcement. You got to click on a link to download the PDF. I'm just going to highlight some of the terminology here that we're going to use later. So, an asset. When we when we when we mention asset, we're talking about networks, PCs, servers, mobile devices, uh, phones, information systems, buildings. It's pretty broad when we're talking about assets. Now, these these are assets that have some relationship to electronic protected health information or EPHI because that's the only thing that the security rule deals with. The privacy rule deals with PHI in all its forms. Right? The security rule is only focused on electronic PHI. So what's an attack? An attack is any kind of malicious activity that attempts to collect, disrupt, deny, degrade, or do something bad to your EPHI. What's authentication? Authentication is verifying the identity of a user a process or a device or an application, um, you know, as interoperability uh, becomes more prevalent, as more and more uh, providers, covered entities, and business associates start using um, the exchanges, there's going to be a lot more movement of uh, PHI, and there's going to be a need to authenticate not just individuals but processes and businesses is this the is how do I know that this is the entity I really should be sending the PHI to so authentication is quite broad documentation policy and an author is clearly going to want to see documentation uh, regarding your risk assessment this rule comes from the privacy rule uh, 164 I think 530 and it says that you should maintain your document, your, your HIPAA compliance documentation for six years. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to maintain PHI for six years. There's actually no time limit that's been enforced. That's up to you, and that's a, a probably a webinar for another day. But the documentation, your training documentation, your process results, you need to keep for six years. What's an exploitation? The exploitation is a specific threat triggering a given vulnerability and as we're going to talk about um, uh, later when you're thinking about a risk assessment you're thinking about threat vulnerability pairs okay keep that keep that in mind threat vulnerability pairs one threat one vulnerability and from that you derive a risk impact 
impact is part of the risk calculation. And just so that we're clear, when I use calculation here, it's being used loosely it, it, because there's no mathematical calculation of probabilities that we're doing. It's really a subjective analysis. And um, that is, in fact, what NIST recommends because any sort of mathematical calculation is just too fraught with error and you know, would would be um, probably just an, a, an exercise that would lead to absurd results and never something that you could actually rely on. So we're using um, the word calculation for risk uh, because there is a calculation that, that occurs, but it's subjective. Impact has to do, is, is part of the risk calculation, has to do with the magnitude of harm. Magnitude of harm of what? The magnitude of harm of a threat expo a, a, exploiting a vulnerability and, and the bad things that that can do to your practice, to your business, your operations, you know, bring down all your systems, etc. cetera, uh, uh, have a hole where millions of records of your PHI can be siphoned off. So the impact is the magnitude of the harm. Uh, what does integrity mean? Is it guarding against improper e PHI modification or destruction? This is really um, something that occurs automatically when you're transmitting uh, PHI across a wire because there's checksums and other things built into the protocols to make sure that what was sent was what was received. If you're talking about PHI at rest on your in your SQL Server database or your Oracle database on your file servers, that's actually quite a different uh, problem. Likelihood, again, likelihood here is a weighted factor based on subjective analysis of the probability. And we're going to talk more about these, but I want to introduce these terms so you kind of get comfortable with them. Operations are business processes and workflows that interact with EPHI. Okay, operational controls are the security controls. The safeguards are countermeasures for information systems that are primarily implemented and executed by people as opposed to systems. Now, when we use um, operational controls and security controls, we're going to be using that uh, across not only information systems, but uh, your computing infrastructure, networks, um, databases, other things other than just an information system. So it's, it's a term here that's used uh, in a broad way. Your operational environment is the physical, technical, and organizational setting which an information system or systems operates. It, it, it's essentially just your environment. Okay, and anytime your operational environment changes, like in the case of Tricare, they were moving their operations. They were, you know, moving assets from one place to another, and that's why, you know, the whatever twenty tapes were stored somewhere that the bad guys got to. That was a change to their operational environment. So, anytime there's a significant change to your operational environment, you're required to do a risk assessment. I gotta tell you, and you probably know over the next three to five years, there's going to be tremendous changes to operational environments because of accountable care organizations, because of mergers and acquisitions, uh, you know, because of all the disruption that's happening in the healthcare space, operational environments are going to be disrupted all the time. Hence, you, you should pay attention to those disruptions because that should trigger a need to do or update your risk assessment. So what is the definition of risk? The net mission impact and mission, the mission of the organization, so net mission impact considering the probability that a particular threat will exercise, by exercise we mean accidentally trigger or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability. So we're talking about threat vulnerability pairs and the resulting impact, the resulting magnitude of the harm to your business. That's, that's the definition of risk and that's what we're trying to uh, baseline in a risk assessment. We're trying to identify those risks. So a risk assessment is a process by which an organization identifies the following threats, vulnerabilities, the harm, the impact, and then the likelihood that that harm will occur. Now we're going to talk uh, some about this is an exercise of definitely um, you know the 80-20 rule is you're not going to be able to attack every risk, every threat that you identify. 
So there is definitely going to be some judgment calls that have to be made because there are limited budgets and resources to do risk assessments. And that's part of, you know, that's part of, um, if you've been through the security rule training, that's part of the flexibility factors. You can only do so much with what you have. If you're a smaller organization, you don't have the resources that a larger organization has. And so you're going to have to make those calls because you're going to, uh, identify potentially thousands of threats and you can't go after all of them okay and and nor are you required to what you're required to do is have a rigorous process in place that you can demonstrate that you went through the rigorous process and you started attacking certain threats at least if you can show that you haven't you can make a good faith argument that you're trying to comply uh, and then over time you will get better and better at attacking uh, more threats as you can identify them quicker um, as enabling technologies allow uh, the industry to plug holes etc so what do we mean by a risk assessment methodology well that's a comprehensive global organizational process and I want to emphasize that because that's not the way that's not the way that um, uh, HIPAA compliance has been thought of in the past HIPAA compliance was this redheaded stepchild that nobody really cared about because really everybody knew the dirty little secret was it was prior to the High Tech Act, not something that was enforced. And you know you, the worst fine you could get was a twenty-five thousand dollar slap on the wrist, and almost nobody ever, ever got those. Okay, the 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 fines now are are, are significant. Signet got fined four point three million. So that, when you see that one point five million cap. Uh, when you're looking at the enforcement rule, that's 1.5 million per identical kind of violation. So, for example, 5,000 records. HHS said that each record compromise is going to count as one incident. Then you had 5,000 incidents. That's 5,000 of the same incident. The max you could get is a $1.5 million fine per that breach. Now, if HHS is auditing and finds other kinds of incidents, then you could get 1.5, up to 1.5 million max for other types of incidents. So risk mitigation, what are we talking about? It's a subset of risk response, but it's really this prioritizing, evaluating, and implement the appropriate risk reducing controls and countermeasures to bring risk to a level that's reasonable and appropriate. And that is what uh, is going to be, those are the words that you're going to be judged by. Did you do what it took to get the risk for your type of organization to a level that's reasonable and appropriate as compared to other similarly situated organizations? I mean, those words aren't found uh, in, in the regulations, but that's essentially the comparison that has to be made. What is risk monitoring? Well, it's maintaining an ongoing awareness of an organization's risk environment. Again, so a lot of these things are cult or have cultural changes implications because it's just not the way HIPAA compliance has been um, thought about. And so there's this uh, education imperative that has to happen. And you can see that organizations are slowly starting to wake up and, and the, uh, the uh, executive teams are slowly starting to realize that things have changed, but I think there's still a lot of education that needs to happen, really, because this is a whole new ballgame. This is just not your daddy's hip anymore. And so uh, given that, and given the fact that the liability is, is greater, and given the fact that if you have a major breach, you're probably going to have a class action lawsuit, uh, which TRICARE is facing right now, and those are going to be coming from uh, private law firms based on some theory of negligence. So you know, it, it, the world has changed. That's the, that's the bottom line. But I don't think the executive suite or, to be honest, a lot of former compliance officers have really woken up to the fact that that's true. What's well, a single point of failure? Well, it's a potential risk posed by a design or implementation flaw of a system or a group of systems that can compromise operational availability. For example, if you don't have a redundant connection to the Internet, and your internet goes down and your uh, EHR is hosted on the cloud and your data is hosted on the cloud, well, you're down, right? You don't have any other way, Wi-Fi, a, a car that can get you access. 
those are some of the things uh, that you would want to look at in a risk assess in a risk assessment to eliminate is any single points of failure. That's that's uh, not how NIST talks about it, but that's a way to get a big picture sort of what are we trying to do here, right? We're we're trying what are we trying to do? One of the things you're trying to do is to eliminate single points of failure that will bring your operations down. What are security objects? Well, there are three things. There are the operations. By operations, we mean workflows, clinical workflows, financial workflows, uh, billing workflows, etc. that have to do with EPHI, individuals, your workforce that touches PHI, and assets. We talked about assets, devices, PCs, servers, networks, etc. Okay? Operations, individual, and assets are the things, the objects that safeguards are applied to. Okay, that's why these three things are important. That you apply safeguards and you reduce risk related to operations, risk related to individuals, and risk related to assets. Technical controls are mechanisms contained in hardware, software, or firmware. There's a subset of risks that are going to be technical that you're going to have to either get familiar with, network scanning, software, penetrations, um, uh, software, or have an HIT consultant come in and do that. And when you run those kinds of audits, it will automatically um, identify lots of significant threats, patches uh, that haven't been implemented, outdated or unsupported versions of OSs, etc. But keep in mind that is just a subset of the risk. You still have the organizational risk by not having the right policies, procedures, etc. So although you may get that help, don't think that that technical audit and those technical threats cover the universe. They're they're important part. There's a part. They're a part of the risk assessment that can be somewhat automated. You can't really get there without some enabling software but it is just a subset, it's not the entire thing. So a threat is the potential for a person or thing to exercise, again, accidentally trigger or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability, and there are natural threats, uh, floods, earthquakes, etc. There are human threats, there are environmental threats. What's the threat landscape? Well, when you talk about or, or you know, the articles are written and they say the threat landscape. That's sort of this virtual database in the wild out there of threats capable of exploiting vulnerabilities in your operational environment. And they, those grow every day. That's the threat landscape. It's this thing out there, these threats that are out there and growing that could exploit uh, your oper vulnerabilities in your operation and environment. And some subset of those threats some subset of the threat landscape is what you're going to try to mitigate against when you do a risk assessment. Now, one thing to keep in mind is risk assessment is a pure analytical exercise. You identify controls that could reduce risk. You actually don't implement them until the next implementation specification of the security rule until you get to the risk management part of the security rule. So what's a vulnerability? It's a flaw or weakness in system security procedures, design, implementation, or internal controls that could be exercised. And those internal controls are not just hardware and software, but policies, procedures, training, etc. All of those things could be vulnerabilities. So Martin, I'm going I'm to stop here at, at, at major stopping points and see if there's any uh, questions. Well, at this point, Carlos, we have one question from Anne, and it says, since the security rule is only related to electronic PHI, not paper, does this mean that the new breach notification is just related to electronic PHI? No. There's no limitation in breach notification regarding... Um, you can have a breach of paper information. If somebody walks in and gathers all your files, that's a breach. So there's no, uh, it's just that the security rule by its very nature is limited to uh, electronic PHI. And one of the things that you have to realize is that the omnibus rule on its own authority, on its own regulatory authority, HHS expanded 
what was considered um, EPHI. First of all, you should understand that EPHI, uh, even if you haven't implemented an electronic health record, you probably have it if you're a small practice or a mid-sized clinic, it, you, you've certainly probably for the last 10 years, if not more, have implemented a, a, a practice management system that lets you schedule appointments, um, et cetera, to run the business. There's a lot of EPHI contained in that system. So despite the fact that you're charged for still paper, you're still dealing with EPHI, and now you've got to comply with the security rule. Now, in addition, obviously anybody that's moved to an EHR, whether it's local or on the cloud, is storing, hosting, dealing with a lot of electronic PHI. But in the omnibus rule, HHS also said any document, a spreadsheet, a Word document, a PDF document stored electronically that contains PHI is ePHI, okay? So images on a network, etc. there's a ton of PHI, ePHI that you may not think of if you're limiting what you consider to be PHI or electronic PHI to what's an electronic chart or an electronic health record. And the scope of PHI uh, is much, much broader than that. Okay. <clears throat> Can you please verify if a fax is considered EPHI? And that's from Christine. Well, faxes are, um, you know, the faxes are this, like, sort of middle ground. It, you know, there's some weasel words that say, did something start out being a an electronic document before it was faxed? So... You know, I, I never fax anything. I never fax paper anymore. I just fax PDF documents, you know, through e-fax services. So if you faxed a document that was already EPHI, then I, I, you know, I think the argument is that's going to be EPHI. It was EPHI before you faxed it. Okay? If, if you're actually faxing paper, I think HHS has sort of... Um, given a workaround and said, ah, we don't know if that's exactly EPHI or not. But the it, don't get hung up on the fact that it's a fax because I, I think more and more people are, are not faxing paper. They're faxing PDF documents. Uh, just for everybody's benefit, you might give a de definition of that very technical term, weasel words. Um, weasel words. Yeah, HHS is just going to love me. Uh, the, <laughs> in in the security rule, um, for example, there are uh, the, the the you know the primary sort of weasel words in the security rule, especially for addressable uh, implementation specifications that don't mean you can ignore them. In fact, you can ignore them. That's a myth. You can ignore addressable implementation specifications. You have to either implement the specification, implement an alternative, if the alternative is reasonable and appropriate, and if you can't find something that's reasonable and appropriate, you have to document a compelling reason why there was nothing out there that was reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size to implement. You know, there's going to be very little, few addressable specifications where you can just say, nope, we did the analysis, we documented, we're not doing anything. But you just can't ignore it. You have to do, provide, a, if you're going to choose to do nothing, uh, and what are the reasonable, what, what, what are the weasel words there? Well, reasonable and appropriate. What is reasonable and appropriate is going to be left up to HHS and the court of law to determine. You take an example of the privacy rule where it says you have to get, uh, and in the security rules, satisfactory assurances from business associates that they're doing the right thing. Well, what does satisfactory assurances mean? Right? Well, it probably means in today, under the High Tech Act, a lot more than what it used to mean. You know, due diligence. Do you have to monitor the BA 24-7? No, that's an impossibility. Should you do some due diligence before hiring a particular uh, business associate? Is that you know, did you do the right thing to get the satisfactory assurances? Well, you know, from my perspective, I don't know if you don't do any due diligence, how on earth you can make an argument that you got satisfactory assurances. What if the BA is in India or China, right? So there are these terms 
that allow some flexibility, but also that um, are quasi traps that you can fall into thinking, oh, I don't need to address, for example, an addressable implementation specification. So let's move on because, uh, you know, we're kind of expanding. We're, today's focus is on risk assessment. We're going to quickly go through a methodology, but before that I want to talk about in an agile methodology in particular, that means iterative. That means you're, this is not something that you're going to do step one, step two, step three, you're done, uh, you know, uh, or form a committee to name a committee to study the problem. You'll be there forever. You've got to get started at the end of the day. But what are we trying to do? Essentially, we're trying to Katrina-proof your practice. Now, everybody knows the story of Katrina, especially in the legal business. That got more press, but a lot of doctor's offices and hospitals, et cetera, lost records, lost data. We're trying to... Through a risk assessment, a risk assessment and risk management, that's the goal. So keep your eye on what is what's what's the objective here. You're trying to contrain to prove your practice, and most technology projects projects fail because of people and process challenge, organizational challenges, not sufficient resources, the executive team doesn't care, no budget, you know, etc. The security rule implementation is more aptly described as a change project. Even though it's highly technical in nature, it's really a change project. Changing, in this case, the way you think about compliance and learning how to conduct effective risk assessments, plural, RAs, is a big part of that change, right? This is an ongoing, evergreen process, and that's why the uh, adoption of an iterative, agile methodology is going to be required because essentially until you do enough of these, you don't even know the nature of the problem that you're attacking. So agile uh, methodology, what is agile compliance? It's a group of methods based on an iterative and incremental approach. Evolutionary development and implementation, you will get better at doing these the more you do. And it acknowledges that due to the changing technical and regulatory environment, the implementation cycle really never ends. This is not, again, a one-shot deal. Yes. You want to do your meaningful use attestation, you better do that first baseline um, risk assessment if you haven't done it. If you want to avoid a finding of willful neglect, you better go do that first baseline. But that is not going to be the end of it. That is not going to be um, all that's required. You're going to have to monitor the environment and do risk assessments when? When your operational environment changes in a significant way and when there are material changes to the law. And i got to tell you, Probably, given the way the threat landscape now, how quickly it's evolving, I would say you probably have to do one of these once a year to be doing what's reasonable and appropriate. So the game has changed. The threats have changed. You know, we're now living in this 24-7 constant online world, and the healthcare industry is going to have to start looking more like the online banking industry. And, and you know, Lord knows we're a, a long way from that. So agile compliance is about changing the compliance DNA in the organization. Really, this is an organizational problem more than it is a technical problem. Uh, and this is a famous saying by Tom Peters, fail forward fast. Get move, as, as, as anathema as this might mean, in, uh, might seem like in an industry that's guided by science, where, you know, if you study the problem long enough, you're going to get the right answer, or, you know, you're going to rely on evidence-based practices here you actually have to fail some before you can learn. So fail forward fast is the quickest way you can learn about how you should actually do a risk assessment. In other words, the net net is at the end of the day, you got to get started. Why? So why fail forward fast? Because it's the only way to attack a wicked problem. And why is and wicked here is meant as difficult, not evil, although probably there's a lot of you that think the security rule is, is evil. And when I first looked at it, I thought it was pretty evil as well. So, but wicked means hard, and, what, and, and it's and it's a particular concept that was developed that's widely used now in urban planning. It's widely used in software development. I'm borrowing the term here to use it for uh, HIPAA high tech compliance. One is you don't understand the problem until you started developing the solution. You can understand the threat and the vulnerability and all these terms until you actually are faced with the magnitude of the problem. Once you get into it, you really don't know. Second, we've already talked about this. There's no stopping rule. There's no rule that says here, when are you done? Since there's no definitive problem, there can't be any definitive solution. You're done 
when you satisfied those reason those, those weasel words, when you brought risks down to what is reasonable and appropriate to an organization of your size, you're really never going to be done. You're going to have to make some calls. Now, if you got started and you got a process in place and you reduce risk and you didn't catch all of them, well, nobody catches all of them. So, you know, it, it, you can make a good faith argument that you're trying to comply. Perfection is not the objective here. Solutions are not right or wrong. They're going to be different for every organization. They're just better than others or worse or good enough, right? And that's what you're going to be dealing here when you're dealing with the risk assessment. It's going to be good enough is what you're trying to get that. And what that means is going to be different for every organization. Every wicked problem, every risk assessment, every risk management program is going to be unique and novel. And it's a one-shot operation for this iteration, for this instance. You can't take forever to get your baseline uh, risk assessment done. You're going to have a limited time, limited resources to get it done this time. Yes, you're going to do it. You're going to be repeating them over time. But you, you can only do so much with the resources that you have. So that's risk assessment. The next big implementation specification under the standard, the same standard in the security rule, which is standard number one of the administrative safeguards, is risk management. And notice that in assessment, and this is a, a uh, methodology diagram that we borrowed from NIST, an assessment is the first step of risk management. Not only is it a separate implementation specification, but it's part of the risk management process. So you assess, you simplify, you protect, you monitor, and you report. We're going to make this point several times here. The assessment step is a pure analytical step, right? The, the actual protection happens in the risk management implementation specification. But until you assess, you really can't move forward with simplify. And simplify here is, you know what? You got 10,000 threats. You can't deal with them all. You got to simplify the environment, apply an 80-20 rule, mitigate what you can, protect that monitor what you've done, report out, and move on, okay? Your environmental change, environmental operational environment changes, you've got to reassess and go through it one more time. So big problems require small solutions. It's not that the overall solution is going to be trivial. It's not going to be trivial. Clearly, it's not going to be trivial. It's a complex environment, but it's going to be built, the ultimate solution is going to be built up of a lot of small solutions. A lot of things that you found out about your particular operational environment and that you fixed. And then you monitored and you found out some more threats and then you went through the process again. Okay, So it's a huge complex problem. If you tried to deal with the problem in the entirety, uh, you can't do it. It's an impossibility. So big problems are going to require small solutions. And the, the, the biggest advice I can give you, the biggest takeaway is just get started. Right? Get started on your first one, and that's how you're going to learn. Because right now, if you haven't done one, you don't know what you don't know. Okay, And that's why getting started is um, the best advice, is get started so you can begin to find out what you don't know. OK, I'm going to uh, stop here, Martin, and just see if there's any questions before we, we dive into the uh, details. Okay. Uh, does a breach of personal data, such as SSNs, need to be handled the same or similar to a PHI breach? Well, it's all, SSN is going to be protected health information. There's no difference between, you know, there's, that's, that's a distinction without a difference. An SSN, by definition, is some personal information that identifies a patient. Protected health information is information related to the health care of the patient that identifies the patient. You know, so uh, now if you just had um, an S, a, a breach of only SSNs, and, and I, I, that's, I think, still going to be considered to be a breach. So it's not, it's, there's just not going to be any, uh, any difference with respect to breach notification. That's an identification of a, a patient. And, and here's the thing. There's a lot of identification that can happen via context. So let's say you just breached SSN, and that was the only thing that was breached, which is probably an un, unlikely hypothetical, but it was all breached from Moffitt Cancer Center. Okay, well, then the context is going to say, well, these are all 
these are social security numbers, we can probably find, identify the patient, and it's probably likely that the patient has cancer because it was Moffitt that got breached. Okay. How do you secure PHI through texting? Well, anytime you, anytime you transmit something over the wire, you should be implementing, uh, if you want to get, if you want to uh, take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor, you should be implementing TLS, which was what rec was recommended by uh, HHS in the interim final rule of the breach notification is, which is really secure sockets layer. What most people know is SSL. It's a secured transmission, a secured line. Right? If you're if you're sending email over clear text over the internet or SMS text messages over clear text, then obviously those aren't secure. Those can be sniffed and picked up. The way you secure it is you use a secure protocol for moving PHI across the wire. Is there any difference between what you describe here and what is required for a meaningful use security risk assessment specifically? Please, uh, risk assessment. Specifically, please confirm small practices are required to conduct threat and vulnerability assessments, attempt to hack, identi identifying out-of-date patches, etc., and any documentation that would, that, that would support that. Yes. The, 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 ri the meaningful use risk assessment is the security rules risk assessment. Okay? There's only one. It all goes back to the security rule. Okay? It's the first implementation specification of the administrative safeguards. There's no other risk assessment that they're referring to, right? And there's no there's no risk assessment light that says this is for small practices, this is for medium sized practices, this is for large. There's in the security rule what they call the flexibility principles that uh, for the entirety of the security rule, you're to take into consideration the size of your organization, your resources, this, that, and the other. Okay, and so there's a little wiggle room, but when you look deeper into it, there's a lot less wiggle room than people think. So yes, this is this is the the risk assessment that we're talking about today, and we're going to get into uh, the specifics of the security rule. What what is what statutory section it is next? That's where we're headed. This is the one that you got to do for meaningful use. So this is the security rule 164.308.A1I. 308 is the administrative safeguards. This is the first standard under the administrative safeguards. It's called the security management process. The standard requires that an organization implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain and correct security violations. Now, there are, in the security rule, there are standards like this, and then there are implementation specifications underneath the standard. Okay? And some of those implementation specifications are addressable. Some of them are required. I believe, if my memory serves me correct, under this, and you can click on the slides, you can go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide and see the full text, I am um, almost 100% certain that every implementation specification for the security management standard, the first one under the administrative safeguards, that they're all required. But for sure, the risk assessment, which is the first one, is absolutely required. Okay, That's the one we're talking about today. We're talking about one of the total 18 or more implementation specifications in the security rule, and this is the risk assessment that you got to do to comply with the security rule. This is the risk assessment that you got to do for meaningful use attestations, stage one. I believe it's whatever, objective 15. This is what they're talking about. So any more questions before we go on? Um, doesn't the nature of a fax make it an EHR once it's converted to faxable data? I'm not sure I really understand. Uh, I, I think what they're what they're trying to say is, is when they send it as uh, an email, but it was a fax. I, I believe you answered this question. Um, 
If not, uh, we can pass yeah, that. I mean, look, I, I believe back in the day, right, when there was just paper faxes and that's what people did, HHS uh, tried to give some wiggle room, you know, whether it was EPHI or not. And it was at a point in time when people really hadn't started implementing the security rule, okay? And, but nowadays, like I said, most of the time, I think people are faxing PDF documents. And what, it, and it's on the other side that thing is converted to a PDF document stored electronically. Yes, it's P, it's 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 PHI. Now, was it EPHI when it crossed the wire? You know, I I, I think nowadays, even though the eFax vendors are going to want to say they're not business associates, I, I think you ought to protect that. I think that's going to be reasonable and appropriate in this day and age. But I got to tell you, don't obsess over eFaxes. That's like a one ninety ninth. 0.91.01 percent of what you need to be worried about. Okay, there's a lot other things that you need to be worried about than that particular issue. Although you know it's not a it's not something that you should ignore. Anything else? Yes, as a managed service IT provider, how do we do a risk assessment on our our organization when we don't store? any of the PHI information of our clients. Ah, see that there there is no I mean that's actually a, a good question, but everybody everybody not everybody. A lot of managed service providers, a lot of IT consultants fall into the same sort of uh, group as lawyers, accountants, etc. If I'm looking at EPHI as an attorney, I'm usually doing it on site. Now, I'm still a business associate because I'm looking at EPHI to perform a business function on behalf of the covered entity, okay? And uh, a database vendor or an application vendor looking at application data stored in the database, they're providing support. They're looking at EPHI to perform a business function on behalf of the covered entity that EPHI is not stored on their devices or their servers, at least not in a case where it's local, it's not on the cloud. Uh, then you take that into consideration. Not every business associate in this case is created equal, but it doesn't it doesn't get rid of your requirement to comply with the security rule, and that's the hard part. You would have to take a look at every implementation specification and say, look, we've looked at it. We didn't implement it here because we don't store PHI, and it's always stored, and therefore, you know, you're documenting a compelling reason why you didn't implement that addressable implementation specification. Now, you still may need to train your people, require, uh, you know, uh, all the other things that you can do. But you, you have to go through the rule, the standards, and the implementation specifications. And then if, if you find one, like a lawyer's would or CPA's would, that doesn't apply, then you document that and say, this does not apply for such and such reason. There's really nothing to implement here. Okay? But you can't what you can't do is ignore it because then you haven't complied with the security rule. And therein lies why this environment now is becoming more complex. You can't ignore it. You can't simply say, Yeah, okay, we don't store any PHI and you know, we just manage this stuff and therefore we're not gonna train, we're not gonna provide any security documentation, we're not gonna do any of that, right? And we but we're still gonna sign a BAA agreement with the covered entity. Well, now when you sign the BAA agreement, you're saying now you're statutorily and um, contractually probably on the hook for complying with the security rule and the privacy rule. Okay, and really, to be honest, it doesn't matter if you signed the BAA or not. It, that relationship comes into effect by operation of law, not because you signed an agreement. So there, I, I mean, therein lies the challenge. You just can't ignore it. You still have to go deal with it. Um, anyway, let's go through. We'll take more questions later. So this is implementation specification, the only one that deals with risk assessment, although the risk assessment is step one of risk management, which is the next implementation specification under the standard. What do you got to do here? This implementation specification requires that an organization conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risks and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI held by the covered entity or the business associate. So the steps. So these are some iterative steps to conduct a risk assessment. We're going to get into the detail now. So in the risk assessment, uh, 
RA for short is the first thing you got to do is gather data in order to document your as is. What does your operational environment look like today? What are you documenting? Your operations, your assets, and your individuals. Again, operations are workflows. Assets are what we talked about, devices, PCs, servers, etc. Individuals, your workforce. This is essentially an inventorying process. What do you got? That's what you're trying to identify. What do you got? This is step one. You can't even go to. You can't even get to step two. Now, this is not a. <coughs> this is not something that you need an HIT consultant to help you with. But you got to go through the rigor of creating the inventory. Step two is gather threats and vulnerabilities that pertain to your operational environment, which you will subsequently associate with security objects. What are security objects? Operations, assets, and individuals. Those are the objects that controls are applied to. Now, if you were just staring at a blank sheet of paper, it would be quite daunting, even if you're not. It's quite daunting, but many threats and vulnerabilities are common to practices of all sizes. And so there's no need to reinvent the wheel. With respect to technical threats and vulnerabilities to your hardware, software, devices, there is scan this is where HIT consultants and tech enabling technology will help, right? Because you can run network scans. You can do penetration tests that we will reveal a host of vulnerabilities that you need to plug. Okay, they don't deal with the entire problem, but this is one particular space where technology really helps. Okay, but notice if you didn't do step one, you're not even you don't even have an inventory of what you're applying that technology against. You may not even know all your EHR systems, all your devices, all your PH, all your PCs that access uh, EPHI, all your phones, all your databases. Having this inventory now, obviously, once you have the inventory. Unless things change in a major way, then it's just run and maintain the inventory. You don't have to re-inventory the entire thing just because you added a few uh, additional assets. So step, step two is gather threats and vulnerabilities. Step three is to assess your current security controls and see what you already have in place that eliminates risks. Okay, because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There, you're going to have, and every practice is going to have, some controls that reduce risk, you know, the user ID and password to log in, automatic log off, um, you know, malware software, uh, you know, this is sort of assess what you have in, in, in place so you can accurately come up with the delta, right? Hey, I've identified these threats and vulnerabilities, but I have this stuff in place, what do I need to do? I need to put this other, these other controls in place to plug the hole. So that's step three. Step four is to determine the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. Now, this is where it can really get daunting, right? You got threat vulnerability pairs, and if you're not accustomed to thinking along these lines, I guarantee you, even if you are, this is a non-trivial, uh, initially overwhelming, wicked problem, okay, that you're going to need some help uh, doing, and you really are either going to not do anything because you're just so overwhelmed that you're, uh, you have analysis paralysis and you're going to then risk your entire organization being found a willful neglect, or you're going to jump in and try to figure out, get moving and do something as a risk assessment and learn from that process and fix what you can. And that's what I'm arguing here today, and that's why getting started is the most important message that you should take away from this thing. This is going to be overwhelming. It's just the nature of the beast. So. Step four, you identify the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability and you, uh, you assigned it a likelihood value, high, medium, or low. That's subjective. You're just looking at the problem and assigning what is the possible, what is the likelihood that this particular threat, okay, so you have a threat which is a hurricane could knock out your power, okay, but you have redundant, triple redundant power supplies. Right? So, yes, that threat exists, but the likelihood that it's going to actually exploit the vulnerability is low because you have redundancy built in. That's the kind of analysis that you would do. Step five is you calculate the impact that an exploitation will have on your operational environment. This is magnitude of the harm. Again, this is a description. If you lose power, what's going to happen? Well, if you lose power, everything comes down. Everything stops. Right? You don't have an internet connection, you don't have an EHR, your computers are all down. It's, you know, unless what? Unless you got a backup 
power supply, but let's say everything failed, well, the magnitude of harm is going to be large. That's one potential impact. But what about if the threat just brought a particular application down because everything else had battery power, et cetera? Well, that threat is going to be, the magnitude of that harm is going to be less. And the idea here is you describe the magnitude of the harm. This, you know, it would cost X, Y, and Z to our operations if this threat actually employed, uh, exploited this vulnerability. Step six, determine the level of risk associated with the threat vulnerability pair. <laughs> and once you've identified the threat vulnerability pairs, then a specific risk level is calculated. Again, there's no mathematics here, so we're using that term loosely, as a function of the probability of a threat exploiting a specific vulnerability and the impact that that exploitation is likely to have on your uh, operation. So if the probability of a hurricane knocking out power is high, if the impact of no power is high to your organization, then that's probably a high risk. That's how that would work. And step seven, and again, I'm going to reemphasize it, that this is not um, a risk assessment. It's not where you actually implement the new controls to reduce risk levels. It's just where you identify them. That is in the next step. So this is an, an, an analytical step. Step seven is document new modified security controls that will help mitigate risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for your organization. This step only includes identification of security controls. The implementation and the risk mitigation comes in the next implementation specifications. So obviously you got to do both, right? I mean, you got to do both. But in, in when meaningful use stage one says conduct a risk assessment, you can't mitigate risk until you've assessed. So this is the baseline requirement is you got to assess, you got to do the assessment in your environment. Okay, that's what you that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do to comply with the security rule. Obviously, to comply with the security rule, you're going to have to go on and do risk mitigation. Right? But, but step one doesn't say, of uh, meaningful use, doesn't say conduct a risk assessment and in completely implement a risk management program. It doesn't say that. It says conduct a risk assessment. So <clears throat> we're going to go further into details of each one of these steps. So this is another point where we can take some questions. Okay. I work for a county government agency. Are, are, are the risk assessments considered public documents. If we identify areas of concern, doesn't this expose us to potential outside wrongdoing, i.e. hackers, scammers, bad guys? Yeah, I don't know any requirement that, that a risk assessment is a public document. This is for internal use. Yeah. I mean there could be there could be some Freedom of Information Act, where somebody can get, I don't, I don't believe this. You know, these are intended to be public documents for even for governmental agencies. These are internal documents. And and in any case, there's nothing in the security rule or the privacy rule that that speaks. Okay. This is a kind of a long one, so. My organization used NIST guidance last year for our risk assessment. It seemed overly complicated. Are we allowed to simplify this year by listing all the threat vulnerability pairs and just have a column for likelihood, a column for impact, and a calculated column, a calculated column for risk that multiplies the two? Well, yeah, we're going we're gonna to look at some spreadsheets that we provide as part of our security rule checklist, and we've done exactly that. We've simplified. There's no requirement that you've got to do the crazy stuff that's in the NIST documents. First of all, the NIST documents don't tell you what to do. They just tell you for every step, ask these 50 questions, right? And, I mean, all that does is want to make you pull your hair out. But it doesn't tell you do step one, step two, or create this spreadsheet, or do this. It doesn't tell you any of that. It's descriptive and not prescriptive. So you can implement it however you best see fit, however it makes sense for your size organization. And we've taken in our security rule checklist and some of these spreadsheets, and we've done exactly that. We just created a calculated level. Here's the calculated of a threat. Here's a threat vulnerability pair. What's the probability of this threat exploiting this vulnerability? There's a column for impact. 
It's high, medium, or low. What's the impact of the organization? It's, there's a description column. It's high, medium, or low. And then you calculate this risk. What's the risk? It's high, medium, or low. And, and, and so, yes, you can simplify. And you, you should simplify because if you don't simplify what you see described in this document, you probably never get through it. Anything else along that line before we, we sort of jump into that detail? Um, no, not just yet. Okay, so I want I want to make one point clear. We have uh, some risk assessment training that I'm sharing with you uh, today. Part of which I'm sharing with you um, that's on the Hip Survivor Guide store, and you can purchase. Okay, now these spreadsheets and all that are not part of the training. The training is sort of giving this overview of what you're up against and all that. Those spreadsheets and the tools are part of our security rule checklist. So I don't want anybody sort of being, you know, uh, getting the wrong impression that these tools, if they purchase the training, they're going to get these. These are actually part of the security rule checklist. But it is how we went about attacking the risk assessment, because obviously the risk assessment is part of the security rule. So here we go. Step one, inventory. So we're going to take each one of these steps and we're going to dive into it a little bit deeper. Operations, what does that mean? Again, business processes and workflows. So you ought to have a list of your, your major workflows, your clinical workflow, your um, billing workflow, your, you know, this workflow, your payment workflow, et cetera, right? Those are, 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 are lists that you should describe and how they, those particular workflows interact with EPHI. You ought to have a list of those. Assets, we talked about things that are tangible or intangible that access, store, maintain, or transmit EPHI. Mostly it's going to be your networks, your PCs, your servers, your phones, et cetera, and your individuals. Now, see, there is no HIT consultant that you really need to get this part of it started, right? You just got to go out there and inventory what you have. So what we've created is just an inventory spreadsheet, right, here. PCs, mobile phones, laptops, and then we've tried to uniquely identify. And what we did in the security rule checklist, we, cre we created a sample, a hypothetical practice to sort of walk you through how we would go about solving this problem. We took a really common sense approach, okay? Uh, now, obviously, it, uh, we, it's somewhat simplified so that we can provide a clear example. Yours is not nearly, even for small practices, going to be that simple. But the approach can be used, uh, and it's uh, similar to the approach I think that the question uh, the questioner was uh, posing, right? So we we have an identification of uh, the, our hardware, software, routers, printers, copiers, etc., applications, um, you know, practice management, email, etc., databases, operating system services. That's one part of the inventory. Okay, other part of the inventory are the physical plant and equipment. We have a server room. We have other workspaces that uh, where these assets live. Right? You should you should document those. And this is you know this is part of the uh, physical safeguards that you have to do as part of the security rule. Okay. Uh, inventory individuals. So you list the individuals in the practice, the date they were hired, the date they were terminated. These are things that the NIST documents don't tell you to do any of these. This is just a way that we said, look, this is a way that you could go about creating this inventory, right? Just It's, it's nothing, uh, it's not trivial, but it's nothing more complex. And this is an inventory of your individuals. Create a spreadsheet if that's all you have of what you got and provide the information in there that you think you shouldn't. Uh, maintain, and then you can say you have an individual of your, your an inventory of your workforce. Remember, these are the objects; these are the security objects that you're going to apply controls against. <coughs> Here's some examples of workflows: your clinical workflow, your financial workflow, your scheduling workflow, your referral workflow, your compliance workflow, etc. Right? These are just examples of. So you know, we're trying to give you examples so you're not standing at that you're not staring at that blank sheet of paper you actually get started and start doing uh, so you really can't again get to step two until you've done this inventory right the, it, 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 when, when it comes to the inventory of your computing assets there's a lot of software available some of it probably uh, um, open source uh, but definitely not super expensive that you can run on your network to get an inventory of all the devices currently connected to your network, and that, that would be one place to start. 
Right now, there's other devices that aren't really connected, and so you're going to have to verify what that what that uh, inventory is and expand upon it a little bit. It's certainly not going to capture your individuals. Uh, it's certainly not going to capture your workflows. So, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to say just focus on the technology because if you just focus on the technology, you're going to miss these other pieces. But there are technology. There is technology out there that will help you come up with a piece of the inventory in an automated way, right? And it'll save you the trouble of having, you know, to go list all these devices by, by hand. So the kinds of threats. You have an inventory, natural threats, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, landslides, human threats. Enabled or caused by humans, it may include intentional networking, computer-based attacks, malicious software, unauthorized access, etc. Unintentional, inadvertent data entry, deletion, somebody wipes out a database. Doesn't matter whether it's intentional or unintentional, it's still a threat posed by human beings. They can do all kinds of crazy things. And then environmental threats, which are being uh, distinguished here from natural threats as power failures, pollution, chemicals, liquid, mostly as, for all practical purposes, it's, it's power failures, right? If power goes out, then you're, you're stuck. Part of step two is to also identify who the adversary is. It's an individual, it's a group, it's an organization, government, nature that conducts or has the intent to conduct detrimental activities that will have a negative impact on your EPHI. There's going to be a lot of um, organizations, the bad guys, that want to get at your EPHI because they can sell it on the black market and it's, it's identification rich, so uh, PHI uh, fetches a pretty good price for fraud, uh, consumer fraud purposes in the black market and the bad guys know it and the bad guys are actually uh, pretty smart. So you got to identify who the potential adversary is as part of identifying threats and vulnerabilities. And again, here's a list of threats and vulnerabilities. This is really simplified. Just for an example, theft of a laptop, theft of a desktop, theft of a smartphone. You can go on and on with sort of common sense threats that you know about. Now, these are threats that you would identify that aren't automatically identified by the kind of enabling software that's going to go out there and say, you know what, your operating system is two versions back and you haven't applied the latest patches and you need to. Your SQL Server database is XYZ and you need to patch that, right? That kind of enabling software is going to get that part of that information. And, and it's probably going to get more information than you ever thought existed and ever, ever wanted to know about. And, you know, you will take a shot at plugging some of that. But there's these other threats that you just know uh, but until you have an example, you don't really, you know, so theft is an obvious one because it, you know, it almost always leads to a breach. Theft of a PC, theft of laptops, theft of mobile phones, etc. right? Uh, policies and procedure. In fact, every standard and every implementation specification of the security rule is a, a, a vulnerability until you've done things to mitigate that, right? So, again, it, it, the threat landscape is going to be bigger than just pure technical threats. <laughs> Vulnerabilities is the same way, right? You go, is, are we vulnerable? Well, you know, if we don't store PHI on, on any local devices, then the vulnerability is really low. There's just no PHI to be stored. It's all on a centralized server. It's all on the cloud, right? So that threat still exists, but the vulnerability is almost non-existent. So it would be, what's the probability would be really low. If, you're, if you have local PHI and it's all encrypted, well, if you've encrypted according to uh, HHS NIST protocols, then you're, you can take advantage of the safe harbor because the, the EPHI has been rendered unusable, unreadable, and, or indecipherable, and so there can't be a breach by definition. And so the vulnerability is, hey, are they, do these holes actually exist? And here we've just broken them down by the kind of safeguards. There's physical vulnerabilities, administrative vulnerabilities, technical vulnerabilities. <laughs> Step three is assess the security controls. This is, again, the as-is, your current environment. Now, it's going to be a lot easier to assess the as-is if you've taken the inventory. If you know every application that you use that uses EPHI and you have that list in a spreadsheet, then you could go say, then you could go identify, well, what are the security controls that we have in place for this application that we have in our inventory? And list those, right? It's not uh, trivial, but it's not anything more than that. That would suffice. This is, 
documentation of your as-is environment. These are the controls that you currently have in place. So you have technical controls that you have in place, access controls, identification, authentication, maybe some encryption, automatic log off. You would list those technical controls as part of or associated with that asset a particular application in this case. Non-technical controls, right? These are management and operational controls such as policies, procedures, standard, guidelines. Document those. What do we have in place? What are we missing? What's the gap? So the idea here is to capture security controls that you already have in place at the information system. And we are using the information system here because we decided that that was the level we should do it. You could use uh, the NIST documents talk about the business process level and then the organizational level. And as a practical matter, I think that um, those anything found in the information system level is going to cascade up. So we uh, chose to use the information system level. What you already have for an information system or other computing infrastructure, so information system is really broader. We're using it to include devices, networks, communications, etc. That's the as is. And again, once you have the inventory, it's going to be easier to document what the as is. Is So step four, will the threat materialize? Will the threat actually exploit the vulnerability? So you want to determine the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. Remember, now you're looking at a pretty granular view of um, threat vulnerability pairs. Right? So the organization's task is to review threat vulnerability pairs that are relevant to your operational environment and assign a subjective likelihood of high, medium, or low, that the threat in question will actually exploit its corresponding vulnerability. Right, so again, we have a, we have a spreadsheet. Here, you know, here's a threat, here's a vulnerability, threat level high, impact the organization, data breach, partial. So this is our threat vulnerability impact risk Spreadsheet. See, we got three different tabs here. We got threats, we got vulnerabilities, but when we're identifying risks, we're actually looking at threat vulnerability pairs. Okay, and we're assigning a subjective value to that. So, impact to the organization is calculate the impact that an exploitation will have if that threat actually exploits the vulnerability and the magnitude of a harm. What bad things is it going to cause to your business, to your operational environment? That's essentially what the impact is, and it's going to be a um, description. It's going to be data breach, partial loss of operations. Obviously, these are simplistic descriptions, but you know, power loss. It's going to bring down every application. We're not going to be able to serve patients, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Just describe the harm that would be caused if that threat actually exploited that vulnerability. So we talked about that. So this is the conceptual model here. Okay, operations, assets, and individuals, those are the security objects that controls are being applied to and that threats can exploit. Okay, and a particular threat can exploit more than one vulnerability. So T1 can exploit V1, V2, Vn, right? T2 likewise. So, but when you're calculating risk, you're looking at a particular threat vulnerability pair. So here we would be looking at T2, V1, Calculating the probability that the threat will actually exploit that, calculating the impact to the organization, and then assigning a risk level to that threat vulnerability pair. That's the conceptual exercise that you're trying to do in a risk assessment. And then in the risk management step, you're going to implement controls to mitigate risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Those are the words used in the security rule for your type of organization. And the reason I say for your type of organization is because that's part of the flexibility principles built into the security rule that says you can take those things into consideration, size of your organization, resources, technical sophistication, etc. So at the end of the day, determine the level of risk. What's the risk? That's the question. Once threat vulnerability pairs are identified, then a specific risk level is calculated, again, there's no mathematical calculation, as a function of the probability of the threat exploiting a specific vulnerability and the impact that the exploitation is likely to have. So if it's high that the threat will exploit the vulnerability, power outage, and the impact is devastating, that's high, then the risk is going to be high. 
right? That's how you would go about calculating the risk as a function uh, as as a function of these variables. So again, you go through that, the risk description, all our desktops contain bulk of our organizations, EPHI, blah, blah, blah. We had a power loss, risk level high, risk level low, risk level medium. That's, that's the exercise. And then finally, to document. Now, if you've been creating these spreadsheets and doing the inventory and assigning controls and documenting your as-is, you're actually creating a lot of the documentation that you need along the way. But the final step says document the security controls the new security controls that you need to put in place to mitigate those risks that you've identified that you don't have controls for to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Okay, so yes, this is not a trivial exercise. It's never going to be a trivial exercise. You're going to have to come to grips with terminology that you've probably never seen before, but it is not uh, as daunting as it might seem once you have access to some methods that can sort of guide you along the way. And once you get started, you can, with a little bit of help, figure out the rest. And yes, if you're a non-technical person, you're not going to be able to do this with, without at least some technology help. But it's not entirely or even mostly a technology problem. Here, we have an example of a spreadsheet of controls mapped back to the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards of the security rule itself. This is a different sort of cross-reference. It's not by application. It's by the requirements of the rule. It's not one or the other. I think it would be good to have both because, obviously, you could show this to an auditor and say, look, for this particular implementation specification and standard, this is what we've done. Oh, you want to see where we've done it? We did it in these five applications, blah, blah, blah. So it's another uh, form of documentation that you can provide. So as a summary, the seven steps. Gather the data regarding existing operations, assets, and individuals. Right? These are the security objects you're going to apply safeguards and controls to. Identify threats and vulnerabilities. Assess what you have in place now. Determine the likelihood of a threat in exploiting a vulnerability. Determine the potential impact of the threat determine the level of risk, and identify new modified security controls, finalize documentation. That is a risk assessment. So when should you do it? The baseline iteration should be, uh, if it's never been conducted, right now. Right? So you want to avoid a finding of willful neglect. If you want to attest the meaningful use uh, objective 15 uh, for stage one, you need to do it now. When do you otherwise need to do it? Anytime there's a major change to the organization's operational environment, e.g. in the case of TRICARE, moving locations, or when it's warranted by applicable law. Clearly, the High Tech Act turned HIPAA upside down. So if you haven't done one, uh, or if you did one five years ago, six years ago, that is not going to be a baseline risk assessment. That's going to be a very much use to you uh, in avoiding fines. So who's responsible for this? You are. That means everybody in the organization to a degree, your compliance officer is clearly on the hook. Your executive team is clearly on the hook. So the conclusion here is we've attempted to distill the essence of a HIPAA risk assessment to something that, this is the key word here, that you can execute on, that you can start doing immediately. So we try to provide a roadmap that gets you out of analysis paralysis and gets you moving down uh, and headed in the right direction. And just to wrap up here, our shameless plug, we have a, a, a subscription plan on our store that covers all 25 of our products, $7.95 for the first year, $4.95 for the out years, which are optional. Some of the products that we have, and you can click on these and go out and see them, a model business associate contract, a model business associate to business associate contract, breach notification framework, training, privacy rule training, security rule training, omnibus rule training. Uh, a privacy rule checklist that walks you through every requirement of the privacy rule and says, here's a, your suggested policy, here's processes that you should implement, here's ways that you should track. Same thing for the security rule checklist, same thing for the cloud, social media, and mobile checklist. All of that is included in the subscription price. You can also buy these products uh, individually. Almost all the products, if not absolutely 100%, have live, live links to the statutes and the regulations
on the hip survival guide and the attempt here really is to provide um, easy to understand and actionable content that you can customize to meet your organization's requirements. So we like to think that we provide the recipe, not just the ingredients, and we provide educational products that you can begin to execute on right now. Here's what you want to keep in mind is that you're going to have all you're going to have a need for policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms. You got a training policy, you got processes by which you execute that training policy, and you got tra tracking mechanisms to track process results related to a training requirement, for example. If you have all three, you can have visible demonstrable evidence of compliance and you're on your way to establishing a culture of compliance which is the buzzword that uh, HHS has been using now for the last several years. So with that, we will turn it over. we got about nine minutes for some more Q&A. Okay. BA rents warehouse space for the storage of physical medical records. Warehouse owner is only permitted in to the storage space when escorted by the business associate or in an emergency. Is the building owner, landlord, slash landlord, a subcontractor of the BA? No, I, I, I think in that hypothetical, the, 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 the owner of the building is not going to be a subcontractor because the definition of a BA is a, a business partner that uses uh, the entity's uh, PHI to perform a business function on behalf of uh, that entity. In this particular hypothetical, the VA, the owner of the warehouse is not performing a business function on behalf of the BA that requires it, that it access the PHI. Okay? So the fact that the business owner could get in, because it's his premises, probably would be uh, um, I, I, I think maybe incidental in that case. Okay. Now, you know, these are going to be. There's no law right now. You know, these are these are have to be interpreted on a case by case basis. So don't don't take any of this as legal advice that you're going to go run out and sign an agreement. If you want legal advice, you can contact me and we can have a fee arrangement. I can understand the facts and I'll give you a legal opinion. But I'm just telling you, under that hypothetical, I I don't think that the warehouse owner is going to be. Uh, a subcontract. Well, the second part of the hypothetical question is how is it different from uh, a data center that provides space and equipment to a BA and CE? I don't think it would be different. If the, if the, if the, if the, if the data center just, if the, if the BA had complete control of the data center, all the assets, all the people, all the security objects in the data center, and Somebody just provided the building. Yeah, there's no, there's no difference. Okay. I don't think that, you know, just providing the building is is enough. You know, again, that, I mean, that's that's a hypothetical. That's how I would look at it. I, I, and, and, and that you know, the court, the federal courts are going to weigh in and interpret some of this. And the reason that all of this stuff is hypotheticals is there's only two sources of authority right now. One, the regulations themselves. You look at the plain text of the regulation and you try to interpret it in a way that makes sense based on the, the, the intent of the public policy here. Uh, two, are any guidelines that HHS has provided. Like, for example, HHS did go out of its way to provide guidelines in, the, in that 500-page PDF omnibus rule text. You know, for example, reiterating that an ISP is not a VA because it's just a transport mechanism. It doesn't store or maintain uh, EPHI. Whereas a cloud service vendor is a BA because it does store and maintain, right? That's guidance from HHS. So that's the second level of authority. The more dominant uh, authority will be when the federal courts weigh in. That'll be first level authority, right? But they haven't weighed in now. So uh, and, the, and there's very little uh, HIPAA com federal common law out there to look at. Okay. Can you expand on the distinction in threat level and risk level and how to determine the level of threat? Is the threat level if it happens or could it happen? No. It's, uh, I mean, you're looking at could it happen. It's not, it's not an after the fact. It's like, you know, if you live in an area where hurricanes happen, could a, a hurricane come in and wipe out your power supply? You know, yes. Right? It's not if, 
it actually happen, it's yeah, you're looking at could it could it exploit? And what's the probability? High, medium, or low? What do you uh, consider a small practice? The practices I work with are usually one to two docs with one to two staff. Even these simplified examples still seem a bit in depth in a practice of this size. I would imagine many of the addressable items might not have reasonable alternatives. Uh, yes, I, I, I agree that, that I, I would consider uh, those to be small practices, and I would also agree that it's going to be daunting for small practices even when it's simplified. That's the nature of the beast, you know, and I, I don't, there is no, there is no um, security rule light, you know what I mean? And, and I, I think, unfortunately, the world has changed, and if you're hoping for a security rule light ruling, that ain't never going to happen. Right, it would defeat the entire purpose of the High Tech Act, and so oh, small practices are going to have to deal with it the best way they can. And what HHS is going to say is, you know what, security rules been in effect since 2005. You should have already been doing the stuff. And not only are they going to say that, they have said that. They said that in the omnibus rule. So it, uh, there is no, um, uh, there's no free lunch here, unfortunately. Uh, what protection is needed for in-house X-ray systems, PACS? that are not connected to EHR besides password protection to log into the computer? Yeah, I mean, anything that's electronically stored for PHI is PHI, right? And, well, you have to implement all the controls in the security rule. The security rule applies to all EPHI, whether it's an electronic health record, an electronic chart, whether it's MS Word document now under the omnibus rule, whether it's a PDF document, Anything that's stored electronically is going to come under the security rule. There's no difference, you know, uh, of how you go about protecting that EPHI from, uh, I mean, there may be a practical difference, but not a conceptual legal difference. In regards to safe harbor for encrypting the HPI, are there acceptable encryption logarithms and requirements around key management document? documented to allow you to rely on safe harbor? Yes, those are the ones that were provided by HHS in the interim final breach notification rule. They were NIST, they were NIST protocols, and I believe our, our security rule training identifies which NIST protocols were required for uh, PHI in motion, PHI at rest, uh, PHI disposed, etc. So yes, they're not willing to don't willy-nilly go out and select any encryption method. They were ones that were recommended by the secretary in the interim uh, breach notification final rule, uh, and they're NIST protocols, and you have to use those protocols or something arguably better to get to safe harbor. If someone forgets to lock a cabinet with PHI in it, we have a cleaning person come in to clean the office. Does this equal a breach under HIPAA? HHS has provided guidance that housekeeping is, is what they do is incidental, okay? So, um, you know, they're not really using, they don't ha have to use uh, PHI to do perform the business function that they're performing on behalf of the covered entity. The fact that they come into contact with it is uh, incidental to what they do. And so uh, just the fact that you left something um, unlocked is not itself a, 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 a breach, right? And I mean, nothing, there's always, you know, it's like PI lawyers like to say there's always negligence in the air. There's always breaches in the air. But the fact that something was just unlocked is not a, a, a breach per se. Was the spreadsheet shown an example of a check of the checklist? No, 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 no. The spreadsheet is, is a tool to be used along with the checklist. The security rule checklist takes each one of those steps that we talked about and says, here's your policy for this. Here's how you should go about gathering the data. Here's the processes you should implement. You know, here's how you should track that. Oh, no, by the way, here's some tools that you can use uh, that will be helpful to you. Who would see the risk assessment? Um, well, clearly, you know, the privacy and security officers, and it's a requirement to have one named, 
right? So they're the ones that are immediately on the hook. And then I would expect that a privacy and security officer, and this is we covered this in our checklist, would report out to the executive team, right? The executive team, the, the, the management team, the docs in the small practice, they're ultimately on the hook. They can't hide their heads in the sand and say, well, you know, I, I, I nominated Jane, who is about to retire, to be our compliance officer, and we're going to hide behind that. So the compliance officer has a duty to report out, at least to the executive team, so they're aware of the threats and vulnerabilities, ask for budgets, do all that to, to create transparency. I'm going to take one more question because we're already over time. So, um, Let me see if I can find a good one here. Okay. Your discussion uh, of authentication a while back triggered a thought. My system is encrypted, but I have another covered entity or even a patient that requested copies of what would be considered PHI to be mailed to them. I'm not set up to mail email encrypted documents, particularly to a patient who's choosing to use Yahoo Mail. When and how does authentication occur, and when does liability for breach transfer? Well, the privacy rule requires that you give patients access to their records. That's the privacy, what I call the, the patient's bill of rights built into the privacy rule, right? That's not optional. you got to provide it. Now, you don't have to provide it in, some, in a way that's unreasonable that would compromise the PHI, right? You have to meet reasonable requests. You could probably make an argument that, you know, that's not a reasonable request because you don't have a way to, you know, transmit it encrypted, um, you know, over um, the internet, and so, you know, we can do something else, okay, to to try to satisfy that. But you can't ignore the request and say we're not going to provide it. You can say no, we don't think that that's reasonable. Make an argument that that particular method is not reasonable and work with the patient to figure out a method that is. All right, well, that, that's it, folks. Thanks for listening. Um, I'll see you next time.